Uh, thanks, Ben, for the introduction. Um, yes, there will be a lot of equations, but there will also be a lot of pretty pictures because it is a discrete element modelling talk after all, and, and some people believe discrete elements are only good for pretty pictures. I hope to prove you prove otherwise in this presentation today. The, the title of the presentation came to me um, actually quite some time ago. Uh, I, I started to uh, get interested in a, in a topic known as general systems theory, which turns out is actually a philosophical approach to how to develop theories uh, for systems comprising uh, very many small interacting elements. Uh, and those theories need to be able to predict macroscopic observations that uh, can be observed by an external observer of the system, but they also need to be able to describe what the individual elements of the system uh, would perceive as what the system is. In other words, a general theory of a system needs to be a theory that all participants in that system can subscribe to, not just ex external participants, but the internal participants as well, the individual elements of the system. And that general systems theory has become the basis, uh, particularly in the last 60 or 70 years, for complex system science, dynamical systems theory. Uh, it's a set of scientific principles uh, defined in terms of uh, uh, systems of comprising many interacting elements. Now, I was reading about that just for fun. Yes, I know I'm sick. But, um, in any case, it caused me to ponder a little bit about our oil particles and our tumbling mills, and in particular about the theories that we have for these uh, tumbling mills and whether or not an oil particle would actually subscribe to that theory. <laughs> so um, hopefully you're not quite as confused as this oil particle about this equation. This is of course the kind of basic form of the population balance equation that we use in the SIMET and other models where we try to track how the change in the, the contents of the mill defined by its size distribution uh, uh, occurs as a function of what we're putting into the mill, what's coming out of the mill, and breakage processes going inside the mill. So these are breakage rates and this is the appearance, is what particles break into. Now the question is, if I'm an individual ore particle sitting inside that mill, do I have a conception of what the appearance function would be for me and every other one of the particles that are like me? Or if I'm an all particle that's being hit on the head by another particle, or careening through the air and slamming into the shell, or gradually being ground past another particle, do I have a conception of what I might break into? The answer is yes, it does, because it knows what forces are acting on its surface. It can feel the stress. It's a bit like if we played a, a morbid game of tug of war where you tie one rope to one hand and another rope to another hand, blindfolding, and then put two champion tug of war teams on either side. Pretty soon I'm going to have a conception that I'm under duress. <laughs> and as time goes on and the stress builds, I'm going to start to feel the pops and cracks as the tendons and ligaments in my shoulders start to pop. And as we get closer and closer to the ultimate event, I'm going to have a pretty good idea <laughs> of the pieces I'm going to fall into. And the same applies to our little rock in a tumbling mill. It does have a conception of where it is, but it doesn't have the big picture. It doesn't know about the whole system, it only knows about its part of the system. So the question is, can we get an understanding of this ore particle's journey through a tumbling mill, which isn't an ultra complicated journey that only applies to that one particle, but it's a, a description of what that particle and all of his buddies in that mill is likely to experience, but at the same time still maintain the capacity to predict what's going to come out of the mill if we know what goes into the mill and what's going on inside. Now this situation is not unlike a situation that physicists started dealing with way back in the 1600s. In the 1600s through 1800s, a number of physicists were fascinated by concepts like pressure and temperature. How is it that a gas has a certain pressure when it's uh, confined in a certain volume? And if we add a certain amount of heat, why does its, its temperature uh, increase? And, and how does that relate to the change in pressure? And there are a, lot, a bunch of empiricists uh, models, laws, Boyle's law, Charles' law, Avogadro's law, 
that were developed as a result of meticulous experimentation and, and, uh, and surveying what was going on under different conditions. But all they were were equations fit to data, curve fits. Um, and physicists wanted to have a better appreciation of why those equations held. As it turned out, uh, one guy figured it out in the 1850s, uh, 1750s, his name was uh, Daniel Bernoulli. And uh, uh, he, uh, he basically uh, described the concept that gases were made up of little atoms that were elastic that would bang into each other. And the net effect of all these atoms banging into each other and banging into the walls of the container gave rise to pressure. And the speed at which those atoms were jiggling around gave rise to its temperature. Unfortunately, it was another 200 years, sorry, another 100 years before Clausius and Kronig rediscovered this idea and realized that they could actually back out all of these thermodynamic equations that were empirical equations from the kinetic theory of gases. And interestingly enough, the equations that were involved were population balance equations, very similar to our own. So it is in fact possible to have a system level description, things that we can measure externally, which is self-consistent with an internal picture that the individual elements of the system can actually subscribe to. The question is, how do we go about coming up with this kinetic theory of all particles and tumbling mills? Well, like any good physicist, I have a penchant to spend my time thinking about spherical cows. So let's think about a simple spherical cow problem as it applies to a tumbling mill. So we'll assume our mill is a cylindrical uh, object that's going to be rotating at a certain speed. I'm going to assume it has a mill diameter of 1.8 meters. I'm going to spin it at about 22 revs per minute, or for those of you who prefer, about 70% of critical speed. Uh, I'm going to fill it up to, until it's about 40% full with particles which are uni-size about this big. Um, and those particles are going to be pretty normal rocks with a density of about 3,000 kilograms per meter cube. We'll be on Earth, so we'll do uh, normal gravity of 9.81 meters per second. And later on, we'll talk a little bit about particle strength. But it's a pretty reasonable set of values for rocks. And those of you who are comminution uh, aficionados would recognize that this is in fact Malcolm's mill down in the pilot plant. Uh, so it's a small mill, it's a pilot mill, but uh, on the basis of these parameters, we can ask a couple of questions that we can answer on paper. The first question is, if I'm a particle and I'm attached to the shell and the shell is rotating, how fast will I be going while I'm attached to the shell? And that's simply given by the speed of, a part of any point on that shell as it makes its revolutions, which we can calculate using this formula, and it comes out from Malcolm's mill to be about two meters per second. We can then ask ourselves, well, when I leave the shell, I'm moving at VP, but I'm going to suddenly become a projectile, and so I'm going to follow parabolic motion until I slam into the shell again. Well, let's assume that we drop about a metre from the moment we leave the shell to the moment we crash into the shell. And we can calculate what our maximum speed is like at be, about five metres per second. Let's put those numbers into a perspective that we understand in comminution. So if we fired a rock in the RBT at five metres per second against the anvil, the specific energy being used is just given by half V squared, or V max squared in this case which is about 12 joules per kilogram, or 0.0035 kilowatt hours per tonne. Now the standard drop weight test uses uh, uh, impacts in the range of 0.1 to 2.5 kilowatt hours per tonne. So this little rock here that has flown off the shell of Malcolm's Mill and, and landed on the other side is reasonably happy with that situation in most cases. All right, but of course, rocks do not get thrown into mills in isolation. There's lots of other rocks. And when you've got lots of other rocks on top of you, you can imagine that you're under a bit of pressure. So what about the overburden pressure? How much pressure is pressing down on the rocks in the base of the mill? So let's assume that we filled up the mill to, a, to this height h, and that height h is determined by the mill filling, uh, which is here. 
And we can calculate that the maximum overburden pressure, assuming that this was just a uniform material of this density, would be 22 kilopascals. And if we take into account void space and allow 40% void fraction, then it's about 12 kilopascals. Right now, I'm under 101 kilopascals of pressure just standing here to the atmosphere above me, as is the rock in the middle. So 20 kilopascals or thereabouts is really not too much. Once again, happy little rock camper. But it's a, it's a little mill, right? Okay, it, it was an impressive mill that, uh, that we managed to get in the plant and it's a very useful mill, but it's a little mill. What about a big mill? We can do the same sort of calculations and things don't actually change all that much. So the mill speed is about 5.3 meters per second when we stuck to the shell. We're going to be going about 14 meters per second in a 12 meter mill when we land on the shell, which is about 0 0.03 kilowatt hours per ton or 100 joules per kilogram. Um, and we're going to have a reasonably appreciable pressure if we're sitting in the base of that mill of about 85 to 140 kilopascals, but still only two atmospheres total if we include atmospheric pressure. Nowhere near the 10 megapascals needed to break this rock. So even in a big mill, this one particle is highly unlikely to break. So we've got a bit of a dichotomy here. Even in a big mill, it looks like single impacts can't break rocks. And in fact, that's been borne out by a lot of meticulous discrete element work done by Malcolm and, and Amal and others, where they've shown that in fact, on average, less than 2% of the impacts in a mill are a sufficient energy to break a rock in one hit. So mills are not breaking rocks in one hit. They must be doing something else. The question is, what are they doing? And how can we find out? So, so far, we've just been using some basic back in the envelope calculations to come up with some numbers, but we've got some numbers. But we'd like to go a bit further. Now, of course, as rocks are tumbling around in that mill, they're banging into each other. So they're rubbing past each other, they're banging into each other, rocks are flying through the air and landing on their head and so forth. So to go beyond a, a simple spherical cow model, we need a lot more spherical cows. Um, to do that, we're going to still keep using good old Newtonian physics, but we're going to make things a little bit more complicated. We're going to take into account that when two particles come into contact with each other, they can bounce off each other and they can also rub past each other. And the archetypical way that physicists describe that situation is by allowing these two particles to undergo two types of forces, a viscoelastic normal force and a frictional shear force. The viscoelastic normal, normal force says that when the two particles touch each other, they get pushed apart. And the amount by which they get pushed apart is proportional to their overlap. However, when two particles collide with each other, or two cars collide with each other, two rocks collide with each other, they, they are not a perfect elastic interaction. Some of the energy of, that was going into that collision is lost during the collision. Much like if I took a rock right now or a rubber ball and I dropped it from a height, it would drop to the floor and it would rise back up again, but it wouldn't reach the same height at which I dropped it. There's been an amount of energy lost during the collision. And this is taken into account using this little parameter here, this dashboard interaction, which sucks some of the energy out of the collision each time a collision occurs. In the shear direction, we do something somewhat similar. When two particles are in contact and they're wanting to move past each other, they experience resistance to motion, elastic resistance to motion, which is this spring here. Until the amount of force required to resist motion is so large that it overcomes friction and the particles slip past each other. So this frictional interaction says it'll be an elastic force keeping these two particles touching each other until we reach some frictional maximum force and then we'll allow the particles to slide and energy starts getting dissipated as friction will work. So both of these two components are dissipative elastic interactions. One for collisions in the normal direction and one for frictional interactions in the shear direction. And that's our type of archetypical model for how particles interact. Then we can then make use of the discrete element method, which is really just brute force application of Newton's laws with an approximation to make it easier for computers 
to solve. So firstly, whatever force is acting on this particle due to this particle is the equal and opposite force acting on the other particle due to this one. So F12 equals F21, or every action is an equal and opposite reaction. We then add up all of the forces acting on a given particle, and we can calculate its acceleration from the second law. Having calculated that acceleration, we can then update the velocity of the particle. And if the acceleration was zero, in other words, there were no forces acting, then the velocity would just remain the same, which is Newton's first law. Once we've updated the velocity, we can then also update the position of the particle. And then we can go back and recalculate the forces and continue all over again. Now you'll notice these little squiggly equal signs, and they're, they're, they're there for a reason. These two formulae are not actually correct. They're approximate. They're approximate because they are updating the velocity of the particle a short finite time delta t after the current time. And then we're going to do that again and again and again, but only under those short steps. And we're not going to calculate the change in force that occurs during that step. That's so that computers can solve the problem in a reasonable amount of time. But that, that delta t there causes us an issue. The computer is not solving the problem I would like to solve, which is this one over here. And in fact, I would have to solve this problem brute force by hand for 6,000 particles in a Malcolm mill or 600 million particles in a full-size mill. I'm going to be here for a while if I have to solve it by hand if I want the exact solution. So the discrete element method gives me a way to solve this problem approximately. But the approximation comes with a uh, sting in its tail. And that is, is that I need delta t to be small enough that two particles don't just fly straight through each other. I need delta t small enough to capture each individual contact and the duration of that contact to a sufficiently high resolution. And that puts a constraint on the numerical problem that doesn't exist in the physical problem. And that is, is that my delta t here must be chosen so that it is less than 0.2 by the square root of the minimum mass divided by the stiffness. And believe me, you don't want to know how you derive that, but you can derive that by hand if you're so inclined. Uh, but this stability criterion has a big impact on what we can do with discrete element methods. If I want to model 40 seconds of spinning of Malcolm's mill in the pilot plant, then I need to, to choose a delta t so that I can get those calculations done in a reasonable time. And the delta t that I can get away with, with modern computers, is 100 microseconds. Anything smaller than that, and it takes far too long to do a simulation. In fact, it takes about three or four hours to simulate 40 seconds when I do it one mi microsecond at a time, 100 microseconds at a time. So I'm already behind real time. But at least three or four hours, I'm patient, I can wait. Uh, I can get some results from it using 100 microseconds. Now, in defining this model, I've only introduced four parameters. So the elastic stiffness, particle density, viscous damping, and the friction coefficient. Particle density defines the mass. My delta T needs to be about 100 microseconds so I can get the job done in a reasonable time. So my elastic stiffness has to be chosen so that this, this holds. I'd like to make the elastic stiffness the same as real rocks, but I can't because of the approximate method that I'm using. And because of the limitations of computing speed, I have to use a low stiffness. Now, I'm not the only one who does this. Everyone who does DEM granular flow simulations uses a soft contact approximation. And it's important to realize that, that we are not solving the real problem. I'm not solving the real physical problem. I'm solving an approximation of the problem that may or may not be correct. Um, so I use a low stiffness, but I still have two more parameters. I need to define a value for the viscous damping during collisions, and I need to define a value for the friction coefficient between these two particles. To do that, uh oh. Okay. To do that, one might be tempted to build a model of the tumbling mill, <coughs> run the tumbling mill simulations, measure some properties, compare them to what Malcolm and uh, his students and, and uh, researchers have measured in uh, down in the pilot plant, and then tweak the parameters until my model matches 
what we observe in a real tumbling mill. That would be backfitting. We're not going to backfit this discrete element model that's based in physics. What we're going to do is calibrate these parameters using independent uh, experiments and simulations. So it turns out that we can tune the viscous damping parameter in a simple simulation that only involves two particles undergoing those interactions I described in the last, uh, uh, in the last slide. So I have one particle that's stationary and can't move, and I have another particle that I allow to strike that particle at a certain velocity and bounce off. And the colour of this particle represents its speed. So it started off at about 5 metres per second going downwards, and now it's going at around, um, sorry, point, uh, 0 0.5 metres per second down to 0.3 metres per second. So we've lost, what is it, 20% of the energy. Um, it's actually about 50% in this case, during that collision. That defines what we call a coefficient of restitution. It tells us how much energy gets lost in each collision. And the coefficient of restitution goes between zero and one. If it's zero, all the energy gets lost and the particle just goes flat. If it's one, no energy gets lost and it bounces clean off. So at point 0.5, we lose half the energy and consequently the velocity drops by half before or after. Now there's a whole range of drop test type apparatuses that can be uh, used to actually measure the coefficient of restitution of different rocks. And they're pretty simple tests. Drop rocks and you, can, and you measure how high they, re they bounce up again. Now most rocks have a coefficient of restitution somewhere between 0.5 and 0.9. I'm going to go towards the lower end so we've got a nice dispositive uh, simulation and I'm going to choose a coefficient of, of restitution of 0.5. So running this simulation multiple times over the different viscous damping parameters, I can come to a value for the viscous damping parameter that gives me a coefficient of restitution of 0.5, the same as what I would observe if I bounced a rock. That's how I calibrate the viscous damping parameter. Things are a little bit more complicated when it comes to the friction coefficient, because the friction coefficient between two individual particles needs to be selected so that the bulk frictional properties of these particles while they're tumbling around in the middle in a bed actually matches what we would observe if we sheared those particles in a controlled condition. So once again, there is an apparatus called a ring shear tester that's designed for this. And the way it works is it's a ring where you can place particles, then you put a lid on the top uh, with a weight pushing down on the particles, which then rotates and you measure the torque. And the torque represents how much shear resistance that granular material has under a given confining pressure. So we conduct a bunch of simulations of that ring shear um, experiment, and we can map out the model parameter friction coefficient between the particles versus the bulk frictional coefficient, the bulk resistance to flow. This is what we can measure in the lab. This is the parameter that I'm tuning in my model. And there is a very consistent relationship between these two. Now rocks generally have a coefficient of friction of about 0 0.6 to 0 0.8, which would be a micro friction coefficient of between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3. Okay, so everyone's half asleep right now because I'm just rambling on about a bunch of stuff. So the question is, does it work? All right, so let's construct a tumbling mill model. So I'm going to use the same parameters I talked about at the start. I have added an extra feature, which is I've included the lineup of Malcolm's mill. And I've done that using a tra tra triangulated mesh wall. When a particle hits a triangle, it bounces off the triangle. I haven't included any friction in this model, keeping it simple. All right. So when a particle hits the shell, it doesn't experience friction, it just gets repelled clean off with no damping whatsoever. That means that all of the damping that's going on is going on inside the charge due to the viscous and frictional interactions between the particles themselves. I then rotate the mill. Initially, I drop all the particles in the base of the mill, and then I start to turn the mill. I speed it up until it gets up to the speed that I want. What I'm visualising here in colour are the velocities of individual particles. And the little arrows there are just helping you see where they're going. Now, first glance, compared to what we've seen of, of experiments with perspex glass on the front of mills, it looks okay, it looks reasonable. 
That's always the first test of a DEM model, does it look right? Uh, if we look a little more closer, we can see that the maximum speed of particles uh, as they cataract down through here reaches about five meters per second. And when the particles are stuck to the line of wall moving up through here, they've got about two meters per second. So five meters per second is the maximum speed, two meters per second is the, is the speed of the shell. And if we recall, that's precisely what our little rock found earlier on with those simple calculations. I haven't tuned this DEM tumbling mill simulation to achieve these results. I calibrated this simulation using other experiments and then I set up this model and asked it to tell me what is the maximum speed of the particle when it's flying through the air. This is a physics based model that predicts the result and then we can back it out with other simple physics as well. So what about overburden pressure? Well, overburden pressure we calculated previously as rho g h. Now that's assuming a uniform pressure within a uniform material. To get an equivalent concept of pressure in a discrete element simulation, we can't just look at the forces acting on an individual particle. We need to look at what is the force distribution over a given volume. So what we do is we divide up our mill area into little cubes and we look at what forces are acting on each of the surfaces of each of those cubes and calculate an equivalent stress tensor that looks something like this. So we take account for all of the forces acting on each of the different sides and we get these nine different components of stress. So this is a force acting in the, uh, the y direction on the y face or force acting in the x direction on the y face and so forth, we get this stress tensor here. And when we do these calculations for the DEM simulation during the settling phase, we find that we get overburden pressures ranging between 1 pascal and 27 kilopascals. Uh, estimated, which is not too far different from what we estimated from the basic calculations as well. Again, haven't tuned it to give me this answer. This is what the simulation is telling me the pressure should be, and it's, it's uh, marrying with what we have already done. But we, we can not only look at overburden pressure at one time, we can actually look at the full stress tensor, or the principal stresses, within this mill while it's tumbling. And what we find, we look at the maximum principal stress, which is kind of like the dynamic overburden pressure. So as the mill starts to turn, the charge gets pressed upwards and into the side of the mill rather than just getting pressed down into the base of the mill. We find that the highest uh, principal stress ends up moving up a little bit and it's about 18 kilopascals. So it's still around that sort of range that we calculated in basic terms. The minimum principal stress, which is the least confining stress of the three, is about 8 kilopascals. So these particles are experiencing a force environment of about 8 to 16 to 20 kilopascals, even while it's tumbling through. All right, so let's take a look at what's going on. So why do we go to the expense of spending four and a half hours to simulate 40 seconds of a Malcolm mill? The reason is because we can now probe some quantities which would be extremely difficult to measure or estimate uh, in the laboratory. A couple of the really simple ones, I actually do these calculations for every DEM simulation I ever do. The first thing is, what's the total kinetic energy of the particles? Well, kinetic energy of one particle is a half mv squared, where v is the speed of the particle. And then I can just add up that kinetic energy for all of the particles. So I just sum up over all particles mv squared, divided by two, and that gives me the total kinetic energy. And this is this purple curve here. So during that initial settling phase where all the particles fall down and bounce around and eventually come to rest in the base of the mill, we have this big spike in kinetic energy as they're falling and then bouncing. And then gradually the collisional interactions damp out that kinetic energy. And, and then it basically becomes stationary at this point. And then I start to spin up the mill, which causes the particles to start to move until I reach a constant speed and then thereafter the kinetic energy within this system remains constant. It's not increasing, it's not decreasing, on average it's remaining constant. 
Similarly, I can actually look at every single individual contact between particles and I can calculate how much elastic strain energy is being stored in that interaction. And I can add that up for all of the interactions in the model as well, and that's what this green curve is. Once again, there's a bit of undulation while these particles bang around while they settle in the base of the mill, but fairly quickly after I've spun up the mill, the speed it reaches a steady state. And the total kinetic energy within this system is about 600 joules in steady state and 200 joules of elastic strain energy. Combined together, that's about 800 joules. The total mass of my particles is about 600 kilos in this particular simulation. So that's about 1.3 joules per kilogram. Now to put that into perspective, Mohsen and some of his students did some experimental work with the Malcolm mill where they measured the power consumption and it came out to about three kilowatts during, uh, during uh, steady state uh, motion. And when you do the calculations on how much material was in the mill and so on, that's about seven and a half joules per kilogram in the Malcolm mill. So 1.3 just for kinetic energy and elastic strain energy. I haven't taken into account gravitational potential energy. I haven't taken into account the energy being lost due to dissipation. 1.3 joules per kilogram is actually a reasonable number when it's all said and done. But what about the dissipated energy in collisions? Or the dissipated power when two particles grind past each other, when they slide each other, over each other. We know full well that if you slide on the carpet, you generate heat. When two particles slide over each other, they generate heat. When two particles collide with each other and they lose a bit of energy in that collision, they generate heat and sound. Uh, and that energy is being lost continuously throughout the simulation. So being a discrete element model, I've got access to every collision and I've got access uh, to how much energy is being lost in each collision and how much energy is being lost to friction. Now this is dissipated power. This is how much energy is being lost per second due to friction in green and due to collision in purple here. And this is a frequency histogram. So it's telling me the probability that a collision will have this amount of power. So 0.01 joules per second is roughly the mean value for the collisional uh, dissipated power at any given instant. And about 20 times that is how much frictional work has been done. So in fact, we're losing 20 times as much energy per second to friction than we are to collision. Friction is the main driver of dissipation in this particular simulation and in, the, in this particular Malcolm Mill kind of scenario. Likewise, we can look at cumulative distributions and we can see that 80% of the particles that are experiencing these relatively low dis power dissipations and only 20% of these higher power dissipations. But where is that dissipation occurring? Another advantage of DEM is that we can go in and look and see. So on the left here, the lighter colours, uh, the red and the, the, the orange colours, are showing us where the highest amount of energy is being dissipated uh, in collisions. And on this side, it's showing where the highest amount of energy is being dissipated in friction. With the friction, I can't really see too much of a pattern there. I looked very closely at individual uh, distributions and a whole bunch of them, about 100 or more of them, looking at different time scales of you know, every 100 microseconds for about a second. Couldn't really see any patterns in it. Basically, frictional dissipation is occurring everywhere. And so it's, it's actually quite an efficient process. It's going on throughout almost the entire charge, except this little bit up here at the top and a little bit down here at the, at the toe. Whereas when you look at the collisional energy, there is actually some gradient of color here. There is an area down near the shell where we've got the highest confining pressures, where we're not getting as much dissipation on average as what we're getting down here at the toe, where there's a lot of collisions going on. So the, the spatial distribution of collisional energy dissipation does depend a bit upon the operating conditions. And that's something that we could observe. We could go into a bunch of simulations where we would change the mill speed, change the mill filling, change the size distribution, and we could parameterize these distributions. But these distributions are not changing in time. They're stationary. The statistical distribution functions, the characteristics of this milling operation. 
we can hang our hat on it. Once we've parameterized these for different operating conditions, we can we can say that with almost all certainty, under those conditions in the Malcolm Mill, this is what the dissipation profile is going to be. And the funny thing is, is that an individual particle can actually subscribe to that. Because an individual particle in the mill can measure and observe how much energy it's losing every time it collides with another particle. It can measure and observe how much work is going on due to friction on its surface. The particle can put itself in this distribution at any given time uh, during the uh, motion of the tumbling mill. All right, so I'm only going to wrap it on and bore you for another 10 minutes or so, but this last 10 minutes I hope will be interesting and thought provoking. So what I've shown is the pretty standard way of looking at energy considerations in these kind of DM simulations. Where's the energy going? How much kinetic energy is there? How much strain energy is there? How much uh, energy is being dissipated per unit time? That's pretty standard stuff. But we are also spending an inordinate amount of time keeping our computer warm, calculating all of these pair forces between all of these particles and their neighbours. And we're calculating them in such a way that we know the force magnitude and direction between any pair of particles, and we also know the point of contact between any, any pair of particles. We need that to make the discrete element method work. Now it turns out that if we know the point of contact uh, of a force on the surface of a particle, we can actually calculate the contribution to the volumetric stress of that particle of that force. And that's done this way, where that big X there is a, pro is a cross product. Now, I won't expect you to, to uh, understand everything about vector calculus, but in essence, what it means is we can come out up with a stress tensor for every individual particle for any combination of forces acting on its surface. We can, we can calculate a volumetric stress tensor for that particle. That means we can then also, once we have that stress tensor, calculate what the principal stresses are on any given particle. And the principal stresses allow us to determine how it will change its shape and its size in response to those forces. In particular, if we had this particle here, which is circular when it has no forces acting on it, but when we apply a high confining pressure in this direction and a little bit of tension in this direction, it's going to end up being this ellipsoid over here oriented like this. We could, of course, apply uniform compressive forces all around the surface of that particle, called isotropic compression. If we do that, we're just going to compress the particle. It's not going to change its shape, it's just going to get smaller under that compression. And it turns out that rocks are really good at doing that. In fact, most elastic materials, brittle elastic materials, are quite comfortable being isotropically compressed. They don't mind getting compressed and being made smaller, as long as it's done uniformly. What rocks and other brittle materials don't like doing is changing their shape. It's about pulling my arms out of my sockets. Okay? If, if, if I was able to maintain the same relative connectivity between the different parts of me, then it wouldn't be a problem. But it's when different parts of me want to go way further than where they would normally be relative to another part of me that I have a problem. So, a guy called von Mises recognised that, in fact, um, there are many ways you can apply forces to a given particle uh, in order to change its size and its shape, but only its change in shape is important, and only the total change in shape is important, not the precise nature of all of the forces that gave rise to it. If a particle is going to break, it's going to break because it changes its shape. So von Mises came up with a way of using these principal stresses to calculate for any combination of those principal stresses what would be an equivalent stress that all those different, different configurations shared. And he calibrated that so that for any one of those configurations, if the von Mises stress calculated this way is greater than the, the unconfined tensile strength of that particle, it will break under any of those different stressing conditions. It could be stressing in a drop weight tester where you get smacked from above and slammed into the anvil. Or it could be uh, stress in an RBT where you careen into an anvil and get smacked in the face. 
or it could be stress in a tumbling mill or a HPGR where you've got forces coming in all directions from multiple contacts with other particles. If you calculate the third particle stress in this fashion and calculate the von Mises stress, what von Mises says, if this thing is greater than the tensile strength, that particle breaks, regardless of how confined it is. It takes into account the confinement as well. Interestingly enough, this is actually related to a quantity called the specific strain energy of distortion. The amount of strain energy that goes into changing the shape but not the size of the particle is given by this von Mises stress square divided by 6 by the shear modulus by the density of the particle. This is in joules per kilogram or kilowatt hours per tonne. So we, it <coughs> provides a way for us to take into account any complex force acting on particles within our tumbling mill and calculate an equivalent specific energy. How much energy is being used at the moment to distort the shape of that particle and then when that particle breaks we know that sigma v will be equal to sigma t. So the breakage specific energy for that particle is sigma t squared over 6 g rho. That's the specific energy of breakage. That's something that we measure in the silk. We can also measure shear moduli of particles using uniaxial compression tests instrumented. We can measure the density of particles using good old, uh, um, just forgotten his name, the guy that yelled Eureka around down the street, Archimedes. Um, and, uh, and we can measure the tensile strength using Brazilian tests. So there is a, an experimental program here where we can actually see if all this is correct. We can apply forces in different orientations for particles where we've, we've measured the uh, tensile strength, the density, and the shear modules, we could use the silk, for example, and measure how much energy went into breakage. And this is a prediction. This is something that we can test out. But it also gives us a way. I'm going to leave this bit out. It also gives us a way to go back to what we know. So the appearance functions that we've been developing here at the JK, the T10 appearance function and the abrasion appearance functions, they're parameterized by specific energy. But particles are more interested in forces that act on them, not the amount of specific energy required to break them. The von Mises stress idea gives us a way to marry the two. Under any kind of general forcing conditions, we can calculate what stress is going to break that particle and from that we can calculate how much specific energy will be required and perhaps that's the link so that we can actually define distribution functions uh, we'll go back to this we can define distribution functions for uh, what is the probability that a particle experiences a certain von Mises stress under different tumbling mill conditions that distribution is stationary like the others. It doesn't change with time once we're in the steady state. It's a characteristic of the system that we can hang our hat on. And we can put it into our population balance equations. It tells us how likely a particle will experience a von Mises stress above a certain threshold. It tells us how many particles per unit of time have a von Mises stress greater than their tensile strength. It tells us how many particles break. It's the breakage distribution. It's the breakage rate function of the population balance that can be obtained from this. And if we want to go to a higher level of detail, we can also look at how that's distributed spatially within the mill as well. So under different milling conditions, maybe we'll have higher von Mises stresses in the toe or higher von Mises stresses over here. Maybe we can change the liner and induce high von Mises stresses in certain locations or maybe change the design of the device of all, uh, overall so that we know that in certain locations Particles that enter that region are going to get a von Mises stress that's sufficient to break it. Where to from here? A lot more simulations. We've got to be more realistic. Oh, I've just been doing spherical cows here today with, with a, a, a simplification of Malcolm's mill down in lab. But the, the idea of this presentation was to open a possibility. DN modeling can be used much more intimately with everything that we do these days. And we can also make use of fraction mechanics and the concepts of stress and strain in the way that we develop our, our next generation combination models. We can do justice to Newton's laws, and we do have the capacity 
to do this kind of research with realistic size distributions under realistic milling conditions, full size. Uh, and we can develop new mechanistic population balance models that don't require backfitting. And so just like material tumbling out of a mill, that's it for me. <laughs>